Well, we welcome you uh, here this afternoon. We're uh, pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Tebo Lishio, who's uh, uh, the guest of uh, BYU's uh, Visiting Communication Leader uh, Program here at BYU this week. Uh, we're especially pleased that uh, Mr. Lishio has uh, come to visit us. Uh, he uh, is the editor-in-chief of the Soweto newspaper in uh, Soweto, Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, he's also active in the community of Johannesburg and has a, a very broad uh, perspective on the, the challenges and the opportunities that are facing uh, South Africa as it emerges into a full-fledged uh, democracy. We're, uh, I think that uh, his uh, his role, his profession, is uh, a central one and uh, one that he uh, has taken uh, positive leadership in. Uh, Soweto, of course, is uh, for those of you familiar with South Africa, is emblematic of the uh, the worldwide movement uh, towards independence and democracy, um, especially as uh, South Africa has taken leadership role in the emergence of many of the uh, sub-Saharan African countries as they emerge uh, politically and economically towards uh, open markets and um, open politics. Uh, the Sweat newspaper is uh, one of the, one of the uh, most successful newspapers in Africa and uh, reaches primarily a black audience in South Africa and uh, uh, has uh, face the challenges, is continuing to face the challenges that uh, all of the journalism faces as they uh, seek to become relevant in the world of uh, uh, new electronic media and uh, new politics, new economics. Uh, Mr. Lichio, just for a little background, uh, besides being editor-in-chief of the Swetson newspaper uh, and the Sunday World newspaper, He's also chair of the Agri Klasti Nation Building Foundation. Uh, and, and I need to mention that Agri Klasti, a former editor of the Sweat newspaper, uh, was our visitor here 15 years ago as well. So uh, we're pleased that we uh, can continue this relationship with the Sweat newspaper. He's also deputy uh, chair of the South African National Editors Forum, which is a group of uh, journalists and editors who uh, participate in the emergence of journalism in Southern Africa. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me your audience. It's a great honor for me. There's a lot to talk about. And uh, in, I had lunch with a group of people, and I realized there's, I mean, I had to touch on a lot of subjects, uh, given the time available. So my talk will be, I'll talk, talk briefly on each subject so that uh, it will serve as a teaser for more questions, to leave questions so that we can uh, get on with the, uh, the understanding. The, I always tell people, my message really will be that uh, I come from a very fascinating country. It's in the southern tip, southern uh, most part of, of Africa. It's uh, uh, one of uh, the 38th largest, biggest economy in, in, in the world. And uh, we have the honor in a few years' time, in four years' time, we'll be uh, hosting the 2010 World Cup, uh, Soccer World Cup in our country. So it's a, we are a very young uh, democracy with a lot of potential and a lot of good things which are, are happening there, but we face a lot of challenges as well, which we'll talk about. I'll first talk about uh, journalism, uh, the issues that we face, and then move on to the challenges that we face as a country, and then so that we can have more to talk about. Uh, I say South Africa is a fascinating place, especially for a journalist. I cannot think of anywhere uh, that is more intriguing as a country that is still trying to come to define itself as a nation. Uh, last month I took part in what is called the Media and Society Conference, hosted jointly by the South African Broadcasting Corporation and the South African National Editors Forum. The subject which has been discussed was about the role of media in society. Uh, we're still debating these issues, uh, which is typically South African uh, phenomenon. Uh, many of the issues I will touch on here have come up in discussion about the role of the media in society. Uh, what are we a about as South Africans? Uh, what or should be the common values that bind us as a people? How successful have we been over the past 12 years in forging a, unite, uni a unified nation from our divided and bitter past? These are the things that we deal with and I'll try to deal with now. 
These and many similar, uh, similar issues provide rich material for journalists uh, can be reflected, seen reflected in the pages of our newspapers on a daily basis, as well as news bulletins and documentaries. One of, one of the most frequently asked questions uh, pertaining to the media in, in our society is about whether the media have an agenda or should actually have a, an agenda. Specifically, people are wondering whether media in the, is, actually should be patriotic or not. The question has been asked, uh, can journalists be patriotic or are journalism and patriotism mutually e e exclusive uh, issues? Another one is do journalists, especially black journalists, recognize their role in promoting South Africa's national interest? Uh, what comes first, the blackness or journalism? Are you a, a black person before you were a journalist in South Africa, what should come first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know. And also we touch on the issues of uh, objectivity, which I don't think we have time to, to talk about here, but I, I would like to get your views on, on those subjects as well. And there is a school of, of thought in our country that is much loved by official dom and uh, politicians. Its proponents believe that the primary role of journalists, especially of black journalists, uh, should be to report positively about the country so as not to promote negative perceptions that scare off investors and, tour and tourists. The view holds that our young government is still inexperienced and thus is bound to make mistakes. These people say that uh, many of, the, of the, our government's failures simply point to a lack of, of skills and experience by well-meaning decent folk. This subject dominated a summit between editors and the government held in 2001 at Sun City, one of the only, only resorts. The purpose of the summit uh, was to improve relations between the media and the government amid accusations that uh, journalists in South Africa were anti-government. My view, and sitting that of uh, the overwhelming majority of our colleagues, is that the news media cannot be expected to suspend its watchdog role while former revolutionaries squander public funds and fail to deliver on the election promises of building a better life for all South Africans. It is totally unacceptable to us for the welfare department, for example, to underspend its uh, budget by a, a half a billion rent every year, given our high levels of poverty in South Africa. Poverty remains a very huge challenge in our country. 33% of our people live beyond what is called the poverty datum line. Uh, it's defined as anybody who lives on less than, you know, households, whole family, living on less than 322 rents a year. That's about $50. Now, 33% of the population, it's a, that's a very, very huge number. <clears throat> we say that, uh, as journalists, that the struggle against apartheid corruption, uh, for people who took part in the struggle against apartheid, uh, this raised the bar for clean governance even higher for uh, the erstwhile freedom fighters. So people who actually fought for, uh, against apartheid fought apartheid because it was corrupt. So to be able to fight apartheid and co apartheid corruption, it means you are raising the bar much higher for yourself. So there is not you, to be found guilty of such uh, things yourself. We say that uh, they should promote clean governance with the same vigor with which they fought against apartheid. A good development since 1994, uh, that's when we got our freedom in South Africa, is that now we have much more, uh, uh, many more black editors have been, have been appointed, our leading newspapers. Uh, thankfully, journalists can sleep, as, uh, sleep easy at night and not worry about being woken up in the ungodly hours by the police and locked up because they somehow could not, at one point or another, navigate around a plethora of laws and regulations that made their lives impossible. Unfortunately, this is one of the challenges facing our journalism back home. Uh, to editors find they have to deal with an equally demanding foe or enemy uh, of quality journalism, which is the bottom line. Uh, the poor editors are supposed to deliver high quality, high, high circulation and mass readership to the advertising department to which they've become beholden in, the, in recent times. Uh, or to do, do that amid fear, very, very fierce competition. They must also contend with an unprecedented skill strength in, the, in, in newsrooms and perilously low investment in newsrooms. What has happened since the advent of democracy is that the government were looking, looking for people to handle its media, and it raided our newsrooms, and we have been depleted of skills. Editors find themselves faced with the mammoth task of capturing the history of a nation in transition, 
But now to be able to, for us to have capture the, the history of a nation in transition, we need people with the necessary skills to interpret the, uh, what's going on in the country. Unfortunately, the skills level are very, very low in, uh, at the moment because of what we call rapid juniorization of newsrooms. Now, we, are, we, have, we lack the necessary people to be able to tell a complex story of a, of a nation that is in, in transition, which is very, very difficult at the moment. Now, because of the low uh, investment in newsrooms, what do we do? It's a, it's a historical issue uh, be, uh, of uh, poor investment in newsrooms. It comes from the apartheid era. And apartheid, I mean, apartheid was a, such an abhorrent system. It provided very, very rich material for journalists to work with. I could write three or four stories in one day without leaving the newsroom. Yeah? But now the legacy of that is that now that things have changed. The owners are not used to putting money in the newsroom. We still expect to produce uh, several stories a day uh, without uh, the necessary investment. So what do we do? We latch on to the next easy story, right, of post-apartheid uh, South Africa, which is crime. Uh, apartheid spoils us a lot. But now what we have done is that uh, apart the new crime has now become the new apartheid in South Africa because it's a very easy story to do. It's sensational, it's dramatic. You can fill newspapers with crime stories. So depth, there's not much investment in terms of depth. But I'm not saying everybody is not investing in newsrooms. Let me try to move on very quickly to another thing so that we... Let me try to touch on the issue about uh, a patriotic journalism. Let me use an example of to illustrate things that, that some powerful politicians think we should not be writing about. A few years ago, journalists stumbled upon information that Dinell, Dinell is our arms procurement, uh, the government's arms procurement uh, company. And the journalists got information that uh, there was a deal for, by Dinell to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia. And one of the clauses in the deal was that it should be kept secret, like all such deals are kept secret. Now, when a, when a journalist stumbles upon such information, what, does it, what's it, what is a journalist supposed to do? The journalist wrote the story and let scalp at the deal. And they were, they were accused of uh, being unpatriotic because having scalp at the deal it means they deny South Africa of an opportunity to create jobs, right? Now, what they forget is that maybe the journalists may be driven by another thinking, which says that given South Africa's uh, new ethical conduct, which is uh, enshrined in the Constitution, maybe the journalist thinks it's contrary to our Constitution to sell weapons of war that kill people, right, to other countries. And that's why it was his duty to be able to stop that. Is the journalist being patriotic by doing that or not? You know, I'll throw that question to you. Maybe we can talk about it in uh, question time. Let me touch on, on the, the work that is done by the South African National Editors Forum, of which I'm deputy uh, chairperson. A decade ago, editors in our country took a momentous decision to end the division along racial lines and rally under the banner of the South African National Editors Forum. That the unified SANEF, SANEF as we call it as in an acronym, has grown in numbers and stature is a tribute to the goodwill that has come to be associated with the new South Africa. It is also worth mentioning that it is thanks to the hard work of people uh, like Joe Cole, who is our uh, past chairman, who, who is a known Pan-Africanist, and Matata Zaidu, his, his predecessor, who is a staunch adherent of the black consciousness philosophy. Both these philosophies, adherents of this philosophy were distinguished by one thing, that they are of their opposition to, to the inclusion of white people in the fight against apartheid, so that they should be, not be in their ranks. But these are the two guys actually have helped to build a non-racial editor's body uh, organization, which is another, yet another paradox of the new South Africa. But I think a pleasant paradox, you would agree. And just as our, our craft transcends the narrow confines of the statehood, the Editors Forum has taken, a, 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 has taken its vision of promoting quality, quality journalism and freedom of expression by working with our African brothers and sisters and helping them to fight unjust laws on the continent. It is imperative that the Southern African uh, Editors Forum, which, which covers uh, Southern Africa, SANEF and the African Editors Forum, which covers the whole continent, and try to grow from strength to strength if we are going to achieve our goal 
of tell, having Africans tell the African story themselves instead of relying on, on foreign agencies like CNN. And we must also guard, guard against complacency and remain vigilant to the ever-present threats to press freedom on the continent. One of the biggest challenges to press freedom on the continent is the issue of uh, what, is, what is called insult laws. What it means that when it's in the, in the U.S., so you have, if, for example, you write a story that someone doesn't like, the person can simply take you to court, it becomes a civil matter. But in some African countries, it becomes a, a criminal matter. You can actually be locked up as a journalist if it's found that a story that you wrote uh, maybe may not have been true or not. But we say that things like those should actually not be happening to journalists. Let me touch on one other a, a very important thing that people always ask me about in, in South Africa. The, one of the questions which, which came about earlier today was, what will actually happen in South Africa if uh, the, our president, current president actually leaves? That is a Tawumbeki. This question comes about because there's a huge power struggle in the, within the ANC, the, which is the ruling party in South Africa. There's a gentleman called uh, Jacob Zuma, who's our de former deputy president of the country, who was actually fired from government because of having a corrupt relationship with uh, his financial advisor. Uh, the relationship was found to be also unsavory that the man was actually locked up last year. But now Mr. Zuma has a lot of supporters, especially a lot of support among the left wing in the country. The left wing see him as the kind of person they can actually do business with. And the left wing includes communists uh, in, in, in its ranks. These are people who still believe that uh, we believe in the, in the destruction of the state and its replacement with a, 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 what, what is called a dictatorship of, of the proletariat so that we can destroy capitalism and establish uh, socialism. But I just wonder whether such uh, there is a place for that in the 21st century. I mean, whether there's a chance for anybody who believes in that thing to actually succeed in promoting such policies. But what will happen when Becky goes? My answer is that uh, nothing remarkable will happen. Because in South Africa, there's no shortage of skilled men and women who can actually come in and fill the void and actually lead the country. The, the question is asked in the light of the succession debate within the ANC, and also in the country, next year, the ANC goes to elections to choose a president of the organization. And anybody who is the president of the ANC has a likelihood of becoming the president of the country. By now, we actually wonder, I mean, is, the, is Mr. Zuma the best that the left can actually offer uh, as, as a leader, given his uh, corrupt uh, status, which has been exposed, and he was literally recently on trial for, for rape as well. A significant point in this regard is the possibility of an ANC deputy president being ch uh, charged with corruption. Uh, as I have mentioned, he's, he's facing criminal charges. It is really amazing how much effort and time are being consumed by the political career of one man in South Africa. For once, Mr. Zuma will have a chance when he goes to court you know, to prove his allegation that his corruption trial that he's facing now, as well as the rape trial that he faced earlier in the country, are actually the culmination of a political conspiracy by Mr. Mbeki to afford his chances of occupying the highest office in the, in the land. This, by the way, is something he failed to do uh, to prove uh, this so-called conspiracy during his rape trial, uh, which he somehow won. It remains to be seen uh, what bearing the corruption charges have uh, on, on, on his bid for the presidency of the ANC next year. Like I said, Mr. Zuma is the preferred candidate of the, of the ANC ruling alliance's left-wing uh, parties, uh, <clears throat> who actually see him as one person who can actually be able to, to help them advance uh, uh, socialist policies. And the trade union see in him a person who is not, is not pro-business, but will actually uh, promote more social spending. In a country wherein uh, even Nelson Mandela, when he came into power uh, a few years ago, he came into power on a ticket of nationalizing what he called the commanding heights of the economy. But it didn't take him a long time, once he was in power and government, to realize that the world has moved. And especially when we're a small player like we are, in a rapidly globalizing world economy like uh, we have in the world, pushing socialist policies like the ANC wanted to push 
was practically impossible. So it took him a very few months in, in, in office to realize that he cannot push those policies. Because at the same time, that the, the, the Minister of Finance was also attacking the markets, He's saying, uh, referring to the markets as amorphous. But he is now the, uh, the most successful of, uh, of finance ministers on the continent, and I think also in, in the world. Now, it is puzzling really why people think that Mr. Zuma will, will, will actually work to, for the promotion of socialism in South Africa. Because he's fully behind uh, the policies of the ANC. And his, he, all his pronouncements on the economic policies of the ANC have always been to support the, uh, the, the, the ANC's uh, market uh, economy policies. Mr. Zuma also enjoys the support of the, of the Communist Party, who see him as someone they can actually work with to advance their socialist goals. But they are wrong in my thinking. As for the, the Communist Party, I mean, people worry about uh, the same South Africa is one of the few nations that still have a Communist Party. There is no reason to, for, for people to worry. And people say that it will scare off uh, uh, investors. But I mean, our communists are mostly crew of uh, Gucci communists, that's what we call them. This, uh, they recently threw a fundraising function at which uh, what, they charge one person 15,000 a head in order to, for dinner in order to, to fund the, their, their party. And most of the people who went to, to, the, to, to the fundraising dinner were actually captains of industry in South Africa. I mean, which really, we have our communists, our family in, in the back. And I think it has also been known that uh, former socialists make the best of capitalists anyway in the world. I mean, we've seen it in South Africa as well. But seriously now, what really are the chances of a party advocating the destruction of the state and replacing it with a dictatorship of the proletariat in the 21st century? I mean, you tell me. I think South Africa offers a very good example of this. Uh, I said, I'll talk about Mandela, uh, talk of nationalization and him having to change very quickly. Let me finally deal with the issue of uh, the succession debate in the ANC. People are worried because uh, if Mr. Zuma has been held up as the only person who can replace Mr. Mbeki, it means that uh, there's a leadership crisis in the country. There's no leadership crisis in South Africa. There's no shortage of men and women uh, who can take over the cadres and lead the country, like I stated. For me, the three, it is four potential people who can actually come out and actually lead the country. I said before that uh, Mr. Sakima Kozoma. Mr. Sakima Kozoma is a confidant of Mr. Mbeki. He's one of the people who are actually benefiting from uh, the Black Economic Empowerment Drive in South Africa. And the Sir Ramaphosa. Sir Ramaphosa is a gentleman who helped draw up the constitution of the new South Africa. And there's also Mr. Tokus Kwale, who is a former premier, uh, premier is a governor from a governor of Gauteng, which is our richest province, who I think is posi positioning himself uh, to, for, for the next elections in, in order to, become, to, to lead the ANC and actually eventually lead our government. There is also a very strong possibility that our deputy president, who is a, a woman now, can actually step in and take, fill in the cadres and actually lead the ANC and lead uh, our country. Mr. Why I put my mind on Mr. Tokyo Square is that he's suddenly more prominent in the media, pronouncing on how good the country is going, and also helping build his image as a philanthropist. And uh, he goes around the country handing out uh, wheelchairs to, uh, as part of his uh, family foundation. He's also immensely wealthy, and therefore has no reason to squander public, the public purse. I think he's one man that we can really put our money on. He also has experience in governance, like I said, having uh, headed one of the richest economies in, uh, in, 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 in South Africa. Can I touch on it briefly on the problem that we have? I mean, some, a lot of problems we have in South Africa, even if we have succeeded in doing a lot of things. One of the major successes we have had is that, well, is also in the advancement of women in, in, to, into public office. Of 400 national members of parliament in South Africa, 32.8% are women. And of the lower house of our parliament, which is the National Council of Provinces, 33.3% of the 90 members are women. Of our cabinet, which has, uh, we have 43% of 28 national ministers being women, and 43% of, of our 21 deputy ministers are actually women. So 
And the issue of the status of women is being driven from the office of the president. You know, there's an office on the status of the women for on, uh, from the, uh, the president's office, actually making sure that women's advancement becomes a reality in South Africa. Let me touch only briefly on the issue that we have, one of the biggest problems we face as a, as a nation. Given South Africa's wealth, or relative wealth compared to the rest of the, of, of the continent, we have a lot of people flocking to South Africa who are undocumented. A lot of them, especially Zimbabweans, coming to South Africa. My gardener comes from Zimbabwe, and recently I needed to have my swimming pool uh, uh, fixed. I had two guys pitch up. One's name was Perfect, the, other, the other's name was uh, Raisin. And when they have, they have beautiful names, then I knew that I could actually trust them because if I can employ a perfect, if he doesn't do a perfect job, doesn't lift up to his name, I can always uh, appeal to Raisin to, to come and, and help. Now, we also attract a lot of bad elements in, in South Africa. There are a lot, a, a, a lot of a, f f foreign criminals have flocked into to our country and actually are taking part in some of the most heinous of crimes you can ever find. A lot of the robberies are actually uh, carried out by Zimbabweans who actually laugh into the cameras, security cameras in the banks because they're undocumented and nobody can actually do anything uh, against them. We are not blaming crime on, on foreigners, uh, crime in South Africa on foreigners. We have a fair amount of criminals, but it is fueled, and our problems are fueled by foreign criminals coming to, onto our shores. How can South Africa deal with the problem? South Africa, before uh, the end of apartheid, we had uh, our border with South Africa, with Zimbabwe, is protected by Saisal. It's a very uh, sharp plant, I mean, uh, kilometers, it runs for kilometers and kilometers. So the people would have had to uh, walk through the Saisal, if they managed to walk through the Saisal, there was an electric fence they can contend with. Uh, the electric fence on our border with Zimbabwe emits about 100 volts, which is enough to kill a human being. Now, given our new constitution, and which, which places respect for life above other things, they have decided to switch it off. Now, we can switch it on and fry them, but it will not solve our problems as a country. We still have problems that we have. The <clears throat> How do you deal with a, with a, with a problem? Got, what happens is that sometimes with the, a lot of un, uh, the undocumented uh, uh, foreigners, they are coming to the country, they will uh, maybe do some menial jobs, and they will buy the stock on, 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 on food and bicycles and actually carry them. Come time for de, uh, on, in December, when they want to get back home, they get themselves arrested so that they get deported for free, right? And then come back uh, after they visit their, 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 their relatives uh, at home. Last year, a lot of them uh, did that, got themselves arrested, and uh, the government, refu uh, the minister said there's no way they want to send them home. They have to, to spend a month uh, and live only in January after New Year and after Christmas in New Year. And they revolted, and they almost banned the detention center there. What I'm saying that is that the... Although we are a very young nation, which a lot of a lot going for it. I mean, we face enormous challenge, which is poverty. At a time when our government has embarked on a policy of trying to provide a better life for all our people, but suddenly we have this huge influx of people from the north of Af of Africa. We actually feel that South Africa owes them something, because the liberation movements were housed, were accommodated in the in, Zim in, in Zimbabwe, in Zambia in other countries. These people actually feel, when they come, they say, we actually have an obligation to help them. I, I do not think South Africa can actually be able to deal with it, and actually cannot. South Africa does owe something to the continent, but the best thing we can really uh, do to pay back is for us to do what Nelson Mandela did, to promote peace in, in, the, in, the, in the DRC. The DRC had elections for the first time in 40, in 40 years, huge successful elections and now they have a de democratic dispensation, and they are learning to work together as, 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 as one nation. I think that's one, only one of the contributions, contributions can really make. We don't have enough money to, pro to provide houses for everybody on the continent. You know? And given also our new, our, 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 our new constitution, which promotes uh, ethical conduct and respect for human, lives, uh, human rights, when these people are walking to South Africa, Immediately, they qualify for, 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 for medical treatment in, in, in our hospitals. And our hospitals actually very, cannot really cope. 
things are for, for 